and let me welcome you to Dingwall and Strathpeffer Free Church. If you've not met, my name is Matty. I'm the minister here, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you, whether you're just visiting with us, whether you're investigating Christianity for the first time, or if you're a lifelong follower of the Lord Jesus who has come to be built up from God's Word and to worship Him. Wherever you have come from, however long you're among us, you're so welcome in the name of Jesus as we gather to worship God together. The theme of our service this evening is that God is faithful. We read these words about God in Deuteronomy chapter 32, that he is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. This is the God who we come before in the name of Jesus to worship, a God who we can be completely confident is utterly and completely trustworthy and faithful to all that he has promised. And so as we come before him to bring him our praise, we can be confident that if we are in Christ, God delights to hear and to receive our praise and our prayers this evening. So with that in mind, let's stand with confidence and with joy to sing our first item of praise. This from Psalm 108, verses 1 to 5 in Sing Psalms. O Lord my God, my heart is steadfast, and with all my soul I'll sing. If you are able, let me invite you to stand and we'll sing together to God's praise. Let me lead us as we pray together. Father God, we thank you this evening that as we've just been singing, we know that you're a God whose steadfast love is boundless, that your faithfulness towards us reaches even to the sky. Father, we give you thanks that you are a faithful God, a God of abundant and steadfast love, and we give you thanks for how clearly you've shown that supremely in the sending of your son, the Lord Jesus, through his death for us, through his resurrection from the dead, which attests to just how faithful and steadfast you are in your love, even towards needy and broken sinners like we are. So, Father, even as we thank you for your faithfulness, we confess before you how needy we are of it. We confess that by nature we are faithless that we are prone to wander away from you, that we are prone to do harm and to commit evils against one another. Father, we confess these things before you, all of the ways in which we have lived in faithlessness in the, the week gone by. We bring them before you now and we confess them. We pray that you would forgive us and we pray that you would restore to us the joy of salvation, a desire to serve you and to walk with you in greater faithfulness to you, the faithful and steadfastly loving God. 
Father, we pray for the world around us, a world in which there is so much pain and brokenness. We pray that many hearts and minds will be drawn to see that you're the God of abundant and steadfast love, the God who is faithful to forgive all who will put their trust in the Lord Jesus, and the God who has promised to make all things new. Father, where there is pain and brokenheartedness in many parts of this world, we pray that you would draw people to the real and life-giving hope that there is in Jesus. Among our own church family, Father, we pray for all those who are sick and in need of encouragement, and we pray for those who are recently bereaved. We pray that you would draw near to Edna's family, be with Neil and Lorna and the family as they prepare for the funeral on Wednesday, and we give you thanks for the faith that you drew Edna to, even in her last days, and pray that would be a great encouragement for the family to know that you're the faithful God who has promised that all who trust in Jesus will be with Jesus in paradise. We pray too for the McLennan family and pray for Angus and family as they prepare to mourn Ishbel after her uh, very quick passing. We pray you would strengthen them and draw near to them, comforting them in the hope that was hers and which the faith which is now sight. Father, we pray that you'd be at work among us this evening, helping us to delight all the more in your faithfulness towards us and your steadfast love. And we pray it in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, let me now ask you to reach for a Bible. And if you're using one of our church Bibles, I'll ask you to turn to Proverbs chapter 5 and verses 1 to 23, which is on page 530 of the church Bibles. Uh, The first of three Bible readings tonight, but the third one is very short. It's just one verse, so don't worry about that. But Proverbs chapter 5 and verses 1 to 23 on page 530 of the church Bibles. So Proverbs chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others, and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed, and you say, how I hated discipline, and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Well, we'll be thinking this evening as we come to the seventh commandment about marriage and about adultery, and that's a topic which is obviously Uh, difficult and painful and sensitive for many of us, but it's one which I trust we'll see will leave us longing all the more and rejoicing all the more in God's own deep and faithful love for us. So it's right that we stand now and continue to praise God in song as we sing how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. So if you're able, let me invite you to stand as we sing to God's praise.
pick up your Bibles again and this time turn to page 810 in our church Bibles. You'll find your way to Matthew chapter 5. And from Matthew chapter 5, I will read verses 27 to 32. So Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Amen. We thank God for his word once more. And before we come to consider the seventh commandment and some these passages and some others, that we'll stand and sing once more of the hope that we have if we know Jesus, the reality of sins forgiven, the reality that God hears and answers our prayers and that he is faithful. And we'll sing this from Psalm 130, verses 1 to 8. Lord, from the depths I call to you. Lord, hear me from on high and give attention to my voice when I for mercy cry. As we're led, let's stand and sing together to God's praise. Lord, from the depths I seat. And if you want to pick up your Bibles again, last bit of Bible flicking tonight, page 61 in our church Bibles, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. As we continue this series in the Ten Commandments, we reach the seventh one this evening. 
So Exodus chapter 20, verse 14 on page 61. But as we're finding our way there, let me lead us in prayer. Uh, Father God, uh, we thank you. As we've just been singing, you're a God of plenteous redemption, a God of abundant and steadfast love, a God who uh, forgives our sins as we come to him in faith. And so we pray as we read your word this evening that you would, by your Holy Spirit, give us great understanding. And we pray you would help us to delight all the more in the redemption that you alone can bring. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Amen. And we thank God again for his word as we come to study it together. I don't know if you own a joke book or several joke books. If you do, uh, I will bet you that there is definitely a section in any joke book, a whole section devoted to jokes about marriage. I think jokes about marriage are just about as old as jokes themselves, and they're all terrible. If any of them raise so much as a smile, uh, then I'll heavily judge you. But here's two terrible marriage jokes that uh, came to my mind in the last week. Uh, marriage is a fine institution, but who wants to live in an institution? I heard some kind of ripples of laughter there, so silent judging is going on. Here's a, another joke. Uh, marriage is one person who's nearly asleep and one person who wonders if the front door is locked. We could go on, we won't uh, for the sake of all of our collective sanity, but we know that there are so many terrible, terrible jokes out there about marriage because marriage is almost a universal thing. Every, almost every society and every epoch of human history has had marriage. And so it's something that we all know and recognize, an easy subject for comedy. But we also know marriage is not always easy and marriages don't always succeed. And when we come to the territory of difficult marital circumstances, that's when we see that, of course, that is no laughing matter. Think of how many movies, how many books, TV series, songs we can watch or read or listen to in which there's some form of marital breakdown and it's never, ever good. It's never easy to watch. It never leaves us feeling good about ourselves or good about the characters or the singers we're encountering. Difficult and painful marriages are no laughing matter. We come tonight to this seventh commandment, and we find that, of course, it is a commandment about adultery. But really, the wider issue being raised by this commandment is the issue of faithfulness. Just as we read the words of Jesus as he taught on the scope of this commandment earlier, I'm sure we will all have felt to a greater or lesser degree how we are people, married or unmarried, people of faithlessness who desperately need the help of a faithful God. So for this evening, I want us to see that this seventh commandment, these questions about adultery and marriage, these are relevant for all of us at every stage of our lives. And I hope as we reflect on the seventh commandment together then, there will be due self-examination that we should all consider what it means for us to obey and to grow in our obedience in this area. And I hope and pray as well that we'll find our hearts drawn to an endlessly, abundantly faithful God in whom we place all our trust. So we'll look at this this evening under three headings. And the first of these is the meaning of marriage. Before we consider adultery, before we consider things going wrong in marriage, it's right to consider what the Bible has to say about marriage in general. Uh, and as we go through tonight, there'll be various passages we'll go to that'll appear on the screen. And the first of these is Genesis chapter two and verses 23 to 25. This is Adam speaking after the creation of Eve. And he says, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 
Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Then Jesus himself picks up these verses in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 6. Here we have Jesus saying, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. God's design for marriage then, given right at the beginning of creation and upheld by the Lord Jesus, God's design for marriage is the lifelong sexual bond between one man and one woman the lifelong sexual bond between one man and one woman. And the fact that we have that right at the beginning of the Bible and the fact that that is upheld and even expanded by Jesus himself, that automatically tells us that anything which falls outside of that definition is wrong, and moreover, it is adulterous. And we'll get to that a bit later. But why is that definition important, especially in this day and age? Morality surely has moved on from when the Bible was written, and we'll hear things today like what goes on between two consenting adults in the privacy of their bedroom is their own business, and we'll hear things like you can have stable and loving and committed relationships without a piece of paper to solidify it. What's the point of marriage if we can just be faithful to one another anyway. But the clear answer that Scripture gives us is that marriage between one man and one woman for life is a picture of God's love for His people, or in New Testament terms, of Christ's love for His church. So Ephesians chapter 5 No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So Genesis shows us, Jesus tells us, Paul tells us that there is something in the committed lifelong bond of one man and one woman, which images something of God, which reveals something of Christ, the bridegroom. We thought a bit about that this morning. The bridegroom giving himself over in sacrificial service to his bride. Marriage is important because that public declaration of lifelong faithfulness is a picture, even a pale picture, of God's steadfast, faithful, committed, and abundant love towards His people. And the fact that it's between one man and one woman, that image is something of the Godhead, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, even the fact that God, when He made His image bearers, the language in Genesis is really interesting. Uh, We're told He made Uh, In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. That combo of him and them, of singular and plural, of man and of woman, shows us that the coming together of two equal but distinct from one another persons is revealing to us something very important about the nature and character of God and about the nature of Christ and his love for his church. Depending on which version of a marriage ceremony you've heard, you may well have heard a minister giving a threefold explanation of the purpose of marriage, all of which is borne out by the Bible. A first reason, a protection against sexual immorality. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, it is better to marry than to burn with lust. Marriage protects against sexual immorality. Second reason, marriage is given for the safe upbringing of children. That comes back to something we saw earlier in the fifth commandment. God has structured society in units for human flourishing, and the family unit is one of those things. The best 
environment for children to be raised is in a loving, stable, two-parent home. Marriage is for the safe upbringing of children. Reason three, that with delight and tenderness, husband and wife may know each other and by the joy of their bodily union, strengthen the union of heart and mind. Sexual intimacy and pleasure is the glue which holds marriages together. Time and again in the Bible, we see a very high view of sexual love between man and wife. Proverbs 5 that we read earlier, Song of Songs, a whole book dedicated to this topic, 1 Corinthians 7. Consistently, couples are encouraged in the Bible to enjoy safe physical pleasure with one another within the safe confines of committed and faithful love for one another, something which strengthens and grows that love and helps maintain it for life. Not simply a means to an end for the production of children, but a wonderful gift of God to strengthen unions of heart and mind. So there is a very quick Bible overview of the importance and the meaning of marriage. I want us to reflect now on two positive principles before we get to the commandment and the, the more negative side of this, two positive principles for us to take from this. First, we must cultivate loving, close, and intimate marriages. If the Bible has a very high view of sex within marriage, as God intended it, not merely utilitarian, but for the joy of husband and wife growing in love for one another, strengthening bonds, and imaging something of the union of Christ and his church, which we await at the last day, well, for the married among us, we need to reflect on the question, what are we doing now to cultivate and to maintain close bonds of intimacy? Now, that will, of course, look different at different stages of life, and it's also something which is very important. We must never take this for granted. Uh, you soon learn if you get married that this does not just happen, that it takes cultivation and care. And it's also really important that we can talk about these things without embarrassment, that we'll think about adultery and sexual sin a wee bit later, but one of the conditions in which those things can thrive is when husbands and wives can't talk openly about sex with one another or with trusted friends in church life. People can often feel too embarrassed when things aren't going well to seek help from anyone else. Now, of course, I'm not saying it should be open season. There is such a thing as oversharing, and there's a right place for discretion and for propriety. Of course there is. But it's worth us thinking about the question, is there at least one trusted friend in whom we and whom I can confide things and can ask for their prayerful support, ongoing, lifelong cultivation of intimacy, whatever that might look like at the stage of life that we're at, is very important as a safeguard against sin and as a God-given means by which we continue to grow in love and service for one another if we are married. Second positive principle, though, I think we also need to cultivate plausible, lifelong singleness. Because if the above definition of marriage stands, well, that means that any who fall outside of it and who want to remain faithful to the Lord are being called to a life of singleness and celibacy. Now, I know that for some, that is no big deal. Some people genuinely love their own company. They find plenty of fulfillment and joy in their lives and no real desire to share it with anyone else. But I also know that for many others, lack of marriage, lack of intimacy on that level can be a real and aching pain. And as a church, we always need to make sure that we are being understanding about that. It's very easy to say unintentionally patronizing or hurtful or unhelpful things to our single friends. When God says it is not right that man should be alone, we need to recognize, therefore, that 
at the very least, a desire for intimacy and closeness is natural, and its lack will so often feel acute. And if single people are being called to a life of steadfast faithfulness and celibacy, a life in which they remain faithful to the Lord and honor Him above all else, well, we need to do all we can to make sure that they know they are loved valued and included, not just by God, though wonderfully they are, but by us as well, by a church family in which they can share in the joys and struggles of family life through dinner invitations, babysitting, shared holidays and open doors and many other things. It's incumbent on all of us, I think, to demonstrably refute the lie the world tells us time and again that Fulfillment can only be found in sexual relationships and thereby reduce the temptation, which only grows with age, for our single friends to seek satisfaction outside of godly means through ungodly relationships, as well as having a high view of marriage and cultivating intimacy within marriage we must do all we can to ensure that lifelong committed singleness is a plausible thing for those for whom God does not have marriage. Now, much more, so much more can be said on all of this. We could have a whole sermon on this first point. And as always in this series, I would love to have any more specific conversations with you afterwards or through the week. It's really important that we talk as openly as is appropriate in this area and learn how we can help one another wherever we may be at. But if that's the meaning of marriage, we're starting to see why this commandment is necessary. The seventh commandment exposed to us, our second heading, the heart of adultery. This whistle-stop overview of biblical ethics on sex and marriage, it's in that context in which in Matthew 5, Jesus urgently calls his people to be people of faithfulness. As Jesus upholds and expands the Old Testament call to committed and lifelong marriage and defines anything which falls outside of that definition as adultery. As Jesus has it, God has joined man and woman together, and that one flesh union is the only appropriate place to express sexual desire and intimacy. And the spouse, therefore, is the only appropriate subject for sexual desire. The book of Hosea reminds us that if marriage pictures God's love for us, adultery is a vivid picture of sin laid bare, of our rejection of God at heart, and of our attempts to find satisfaction and to set our affections and our hearts elsewhere. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Now that language is provocative and painful. It is meant to be because it shows the true devastation of our sinful rejection of God and what that really does. If God takes such a stark view of adultery, then of course, of course that means that the baseline physical act of adultery, sexual intercourse with someone other than our spouse, is entirely inappropriate and entirely wrong. But so too is anything which leads up to that act, whether we're single or whether we're married. This command, you shall not commit adultery, it covers cultivating an overly close relationship with someone of the opposite sex, a relationship based on flirtation, based on them wanting to find you attractive and impressive, based on getting a level of appreciation from them that you feel you might be lacking at home. This commandment is covering overly intimate physical activity with someone who isn't your spouse, maybe your boyfriend or girlfriend, maybe your fiance. Often, 
in the work I did with young people, the question that I would get asked was, how far is too far? How far can we go before we've crossed the line into sin? And the answer is, that is the wrong question to ask. The Bible takes sexual immorality very seriously. Paul says we should flee from it. And so the question for all of us is not how far can I go, but how far can I flee from sexual immorality, whether we're single or married? Jesus says this commandment to not commit adultery, it covers thinking lustful thoughts about other people, mentally undressing them, wondering what your life might look like if you'd married them instead of your husband or wife. And of course, this command therefore also covers the use of pornography. Even laying aside the rife exploitation of vulnerable women that goes on in that horrible industry and the highly addictive nature of those materials, well, the act of looking at other people performing sexual acts for our own gratification is an ugly and an adulterous thing. This commandment goes very broad then, so much more broad than merely committing sexual acts outside of a marriage bond. And I wonder if you notice the pattern in all of the things that I've just said. It's a helpful rule of thumb. If it's about me and my gratification, then we are on dangerous ground. Remember, marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. An intimate, physical, sexual love within marriage is something which should therefore always be focused on service of and love for the other. It is not something, never something, which is a means to an end of our own selfish gratification. And anything we do which treats it as that is a wrong view and a very short step to adultery. I'm aware that all of this can be so painful and so exposing for us to reflect on. This is a really difficult area, an area in which we will all feel acutely aware of our own history of failure, whatever that might look like for us. I remember one friend in particular telling me about how sexual sin had destroyed a marriage within her family. One Christmas, it had all come to light one year and it caused so much pain and devastation. And she said to me at the time, you know, it's, it's just really shown me how ugly sin is. I just hate it so, so much. I remember when she told me that story, I remember being so convicted then by my own sin. I was single at the time, but and I wouldn't therefore have described myself as an adulterer, but it was one of those occasions where I saw the same darkness of sin clouding my own heart, even if it expressed itself very, very differently. And I take it that we can all relate to that. I take it that when we hear Jesus telling us that to even look at another person with lust in our eyes and our hearts makes us guilty of adultery, well then, to some degree, we all need to feel that challenge. Jesus himself tells us to take extreme lengths to avoid sexual sin. It's better to cut off one of the members of your body than to fall into sexual sin, Jesus says. The Apostle Paul, I mentioned earlier, tells us to flee from sexual immorality. We must do all we can to strive for obedience in this area. And also we must recognize that this can be an area of particular shame. Sexual sin, maybe more so than any of the other commandments that we look at, this can be a really private struggle and one which we may feel like we can't get help with because what would people think of us what would people think of me if I were to, to air my dirty laundry in front of them? Friends, I know it's not comfortable. And again, I'm not saying we all need to share with everyone all the time everything. But let's remember, sin 
thrives in dark places. So as far as we can appropriately, let's seek to be open with one another, confessing sin to one another, and asking for prayer. Uh, I want to say at this point that there is so much more that we could say about topics connected to this commandment, about divorce and remarriage and abuse and abandonment, very, very important issues worthy of treatment in their own right, and we just don't have time to cover all or even any of them. But what I do want to say is two things. First, let me repeat again, I and the elders, we are happy to have any conversations about specific struggles or questions or circumstances which a sermon can't cover in 30 minutes. We would love to help you work through any specific struggles or questions that you might have. That's the first thing I want to say. The second is that life is messy. And marriage relationships can be very, very hard. And we need to respond to every situation with as much compassion and grace as we can. And so I'm aware that even in a gathering of this size, there may well be people among us this evening, maybe people watching online even, for whom this is an area of great pain. If that's you, you may have experienced really true and deep hurt, but the gospel brings real healing and hope. You may have experienced, may be experiencing even now deep shame. The gospel restores and gives life. In fact, as we've already seen, this is an area in which we all need to flee to Christ for mercy. And that's where we want to draw to a close. If we've seen the heart of adultery, we now consider the hope of adulterers. If that defines all of us, then that's a hope that we all desperately need to cling to. Hosea exposes the reality, the, the ugliness of our sin. It exposes as adultery any inclination we have to turn away from God. But even even as it does that, in Hosea, we also see what a wonderfully faithful God we have. Even as God takes on the role of a jilted and cuckolded husband in Hosea 1, well, in Hosea 2, we read these wonderful words, God speaking to his people. Hosea 2, therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of a core a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. And no longer will you call me my Baal, for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. It's a wonderful reminder to us that we are faithless, so pitifully, so in embarrassingly, consistently faithless. But God is so wonderfully faithful. If we're in Christ, if we know him as our Lord, as our King, though we find that our commitment to honoring God with all of our lives can be fragile and failing, we also find that God's commitment to showing us his people grace and mercy and help in our need is endless and inexhaustible. That's what we lay our hope in. It's right that we strive for obedience in this area. Of course, it's right that we do that, but we don't lay our hope in it, not in our own abilities to make ourselves pure. We can't do that. But in God's promise to redeem and to restore faithless people 
like us. That is the hope, the only hope for adulterous and faithless hearts. There are some deeply reassuring words spoken in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 to adulterous and sexually fallen and broken people. Paul has this to say, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We touched on it earlier, but maybe more so than any other sin, sexual sin can leave us feeling particularly broken, dirty, and full of shame. Paul says that just like all forms of sin, if we are in Christ, that sin is no longer the thing that defines us. Such were some of you past tense. No matter what our background may be, if we are trusting in Christ, if we are bringing our sin before him and asking him for forgiveness, well, we can say with confidence, we have been washed, we have been sanctified, we have been justified. Maybe in the days ahead, maybe this week, if you have moments reflecting on this sermon where you feel particularly conscious of past failures or even moments of failure in the present, even as you grieve and sorrow over your sin, there's three words you can remember and speak over yourself. If I am in Christ, I am washed. I've been sanctified. I've been justified, not through my own efforts, but by God's abundant grace. We are faithless. But God is faithful. God covers over our every failing. So to the many adulterous hearts among us, let us be quick to flee to Christ, to know God's mercy in him and to ask for his help as we seek to grow in imitating his faithfulness by being people marked by that same faithfulness in all of our relationships within marriage and with one another. Let me pray as we draw to a close. Father God, we thank you that you are faithful. We confess before you once again how faithless we are and we pray that where there is a sin in this area in our hearts and in our lives, you would draw us to sorrow and to right repentance. But we pray as well, you would help us to remember the hope of adulterous hearts, that in Christ we have been washed, we have been sanctified, we have been justified. And help us therefore to flee from sin of all kinds, to flee from sexual sin and to walk with you in the light, in obedience and in faithfulness to one another and to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's right that we, as we reflect on God's faithfulness, we sing our praises to him. And we're going to do this in the words of our final song, before the throne of God above. We are faithless, but in Christ we have a strong and perfect plea. So let's stand and sing our praise to God together.
Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen.